All right, this video reviews the cryptanalysis technique of index of coincidence. Um, and first, let's, let's review the, the purpose or the goal of this analysis technique. Um, the goal of this is to determine the key length of Wigner-like ciphers. Um, and be before we go any further, I want you to consider this. What do you think the key length in this context uh, of a rail fence cipher would be? Well, what do we mean by key length, first of all? Um, that's the, the, the number of characters in, in the key of a Wigner cipher, right? Because a, a, a Caesar cipher only has one letter in its key, Wigner has multiple. Um, a rail fence is a, a ci the rail fence cipher is a transposition cipher, not a substitution cipher. Um, but we can also think of it as a Caesar cipher with A as the key. Um, and then afterwards, we just scramble everything. So when you think about it this way, if you were to um, be doing an analysis on, uh, on ciphertext that was encrypted with a rail fence cipher, and you ran the index of coincidence formula on it, um, it would tell you that the most likely key length was one. Um, so I tell you that because as you're writing your program, um, Keeping this in mind will help you be able to, def to um, will will help you make your algorithm be a little bit more efficient. Um, what I mean by that is that by running index of coincidence first, you can actually eliminate two um, two of the four different ciphers that you're looking for, right? Because uh, the four different ciphertexts that you have are encrypted with. Um, a Caesar cipher, Wigner cipher, rail fence cipher, or one time pat, right? Well, if you have a key length of one, you already know that it's either going to be a rail fence cipher or a Caesar cipher. Uh, if it's more than one, then you know it's got to be either a Wigner cipher or one time pad. Um, so, my suggestion is that you run index of coincidence first before you do any other analyses on the cipher text. Okay, um, let's talk about um, why method one of index of coincidence is so bad. I didn't really talk about it in lecture very much. Um, if you want to know the details of how it works, uh, go ahead and read the textbook. It has a pretty good explanation. Um, you might have to read it a couple of times. I, I think I did. As, as, but basically, here's, here's what makes it so bad. You don't even have to understand how it works. All you have to do is look at what you're comparing the output of the formula to to get some meaningful information, right? So the output from this formula is going to be somewhere along this scale down here at the bottom, right? You have this these expected index of coincidence values. If the key length is 1, you're looking at a value of 0 0.0662, 0 0.052, and so on. Now, the bigger the key length gets, which is what this period means, um, the bigger the, the key length, the smaller the distance in value between it and its surrounding key length values. Um, what I mean by that is here, look at here. So the difference between a key length of 4 and a key length of 5 in terms of the output of this formula is one one thousandth. That's not much of a difference. That doesn't leave a whole lot of room for uh, error, for uh, rounding problems. And that's a problem because these, these numbers down here, these expected index of coincidence values, um, they can change based on the sample of normal text that you computed them with. Um, so Different different text samples um, will have different st statistical models, right? So the or statistical norms. So there, there's this approach is just fraught with problems because you know look look again here at the the difference between the value for a period of five and ten. The the difference here is only three thousand three one thousandths. Um, you've got four numbers that aren't even shown here. And the difference between this and this is three? 
one thousandths. So it's very imprecise, um, and that's why. So that's why I recommend using this uh, method two that Wikipedia has. Um, if you decide you want to understand more and read the Wikipedia page, be my guest. Uh, it does get pretty hefty into um, technical information, uh, but you're, you're welcome to try to understand it. It took me quite a while to make sure that what I was reading was, was uh, I was understanding it correctly, but, and that's why I've tried to condense it down into these slides for you. Okay, so next thing I want to talk about is what is this whole deal about these numbers, 1.73 and 0 0.067? Where do they come from and why do we care about them? Well, this number is what the index of coincidence formula will give us for any text that is encrypted or not with a key length of one. Okay. Now, what I mean by encrypted or not is, I mean, you could, you could encrypt it with a Caesar cipher and a key of A, not change anything. Your key length was one. You still are going to get something really close to, to one of these numbers, depending on how you calculate it. Now, method two uses this 1.73 value, and it's been normalized. What do I mean by that? Well, that means it's been, it has been altered slightly to accommodate the fact that in English we have 26 letters in our alphabet. That's all it means. Um, and to kind of show you that these really are the same thing, I'm just going to show you that um, if I type in 0 0.067 and I multiply it by 26, it gives me roughly 1.73. And actually if we do 1.73 and divide it by 26, um, it gives us an even better, uh, a closer number to 0. 067. And if you look here, that's uh, on the first method, the slide about the first method of index co of coincidence. That's why this says 0 0.066 and this says 0 0.067 because it's, it's, it's a rounding error one way or the other. Um, anyway, so any text with a key length of one will give you that number as its index of coincidence. So that's where it comes from. Um, and that's kind of our standard for deciding whether or not the length that we're considering when we compute the index of coincidence is um, telling us that that might be the, the key length. Um, okay, so let's, let's actually create an example to work with here. I'm going to go into Security Ninja again, into encryption, and this time we're working with Vigneer and we want to do. All right, so let's input some text. I'm going to use the same sentence as uh, the other video that I made. Um, and this time I'm going to use the key Fred. No real reason for that. Uh, just wanted to use Fred. Okay, so here's our resulting ciphertext. And again, if you want to step through this one in letter encryption at a time, you can use the next and previous buttons, but we're just going to grab the whole ciphertext. Now, uh, on the decryption side, I do have an index of coincidence thing here, but uh, when I created this, I didn't know about method number two, and so it's going to give us numbers that we aren't that aren't going to be as useful to, useful to us. But um, now we have our cipher text. But actually, what I want to explain uh, before we go any further is what uh, what I mean when I say a Vignier column. Um, let's let's go ahead and I've all, on on this in this file, what I've done is I've altered the plain text just slightly by removing all the spaces because in classical ciphers we don't consider spaces we just mash everything together make it the same case um, put it into uppercase usually um, and just deal with that we don't we don't deal with spaces and then along this first line here I've repeated the key Fred 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 all the way down to be the same length as the plain text. Now this is how we would um, manually encrypt something with a Vignier cipher, right? Well, this is all great, but what if I don't like this whole repeating key up at the top? What if I want to see everything that was encrypted with F, R, E, and D respectfully? Well, let's just divide it into columns, right? So that's what I've done in this file. I've taken the exact same plain text, 
but I put a carriage return at the end of the length of the key that I'm using to encrypt it. And that means that all of these letters here in the first column will be encrypted with F, R, E, and then D as we go across. Now, you can verify that by just looking here. This, this second T in the, in the plain text will, in fact, be encrypted with F. And then down here, you've got an A, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. You, you get the idea. So these, this is what I mean when I'm talking about a Vigneer column. And the reason why those are helpful, um, the reason why we care about Vigneer columns is that until we make a Vigneer column, we can't make any more intelligent decisions about decrypting it. All right, so let's, let's actually take this concept of the Vigneer column and apply it to actual ciphertext. I've um, already pasted the encrypted text here in this, um, in this other file. Now, when we're doing the index of coincidence, um, if you'll remember here in the instructions, what we're doing is we're iteratively dividing the text into columns of increasing size or period, right? So back here, um, we, don't, we don't know what the key size was that was used to encrypt this. All we know is that we've got this text, um, so we're going to start with one, we're going to divide it into columns um, and determine if it's a Caesar cipher. Well, that's not as very interesting. Let's just jump to a column size of three. So let's just, let's pretend for now that the key we think it might be is, oh, I meant to say ABC, I don't know why I did, okay. Um, so we're going to divide this into Vigneer columns just by going like this really quick. Okay, so all of these in the first column are, we're going to say were possibly encrypted by the first out of three characters in a three character key. All right, once we know all of these what all of the characters are that we're going to divide into this particular Vigneer column, we can treat that column as a, a Caesar cipher and we know what to do with it now, right? So the reason why we want to look at only one single column when we use the formula for index of coincidence is that if all the letters in that column were in fact encrypted with the same character uh, when we had the plain text, um, sorry, so if it was in, if, if the letters in that column of the ciphertext here were in fact encrypted from the same character in, from the key, then they'll have a special relationship with each other, meaning that they'll have an index of coincidence of near or above 1.73, because that's what anything with the same key, um, encrypted with the same key, is going to give us. So you're going to divide the ciphertext into columns. We already talked about that multiple times. Now, you're going to calculate this formula for each column, meaning that if, if we're at number three, if we're at a column size of three in our iteration, meaning we've already done columns one and two, um, we're gonna take all of, the, all of the text in this first column, so Y, V, H, K, S, I, so on and so forth, and that's the text we're going to consider. And we're going to calculate the frequency of each letter uh, as an integer and plug it into the, the formula. Um, and the, the number of C letters in the alphabet, that, that refers, I mean, that's of course in English, that's going to be 26. Um, but we're gonna calculate this for each of these columns. And then once we have, once you've done this for each of the columns, you want to average their values. Um, and that average is the index of coincidence for that potential key length. So back to this simple example, um, since right now we're considering a key length of three, the index of coincidence after we've averaged all three columns will be the index of coincidence for three. So then we have to do the index of coincidence for four and five, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're dividing the ciphertext into columns multiple times and then only looking at one column at a time and one letter frequency from that column at a time. Uh, so the complexity of this formula is pretty high in terms of, of big O, but you know that's okay. That's the only way to really accurately find the index of coincidence. 
Uh, okay, so let's see what the output of this calculation is from my code. So I'm going to uh, just get a fresh, make a fresh file with this ciphertext um, and save it in the same place that I saved the previous one. Uh, so I'm just going to name this uh, I of C example. And now I'm going to just cut to where I already have the code pasted and, and ready for you to see. Okay, so here's, here's my code. Again, I've created an object um, for, of my class, uh, giving it the, the file name. Now this is not how your homework will work. This is just me working with my Python code. Um, but I've grabbed that. It's done some, you know, frequency stuff on the ciphertext. And I've had it calculate the index of coincidence. And here, the, all, all that this means is that I had a default number of 10. I didn't want to print out 10 different results on the screen uh, for you. So I just limited that down to 5. And again, in this instance, what my code has done is sorted the the items that it returns by those that are most likely uh, to be the case. Now, you can see here that 15 has a really big number. Um, that's kind of odd because our key was at Fred, if you remember, and, which is just a key length of, of four. Um, but that what that means is if uh, we were running this, um, running like your homework on this file, the first attempt at decrypting it probably wouldn't work because it has a different key length than what is, um, it has a different key length than the highest rated one by this, by this formula. So with this output, we know what the most likely key length is. It's 15, even though the real one is 14, or sorry, four. <laughs> um, but we still don't know what the key is. So assuming that with long enough ciphertext, the first possibility, the, the most likely possibility was the correct one, what we would do is we would, um, is we would just have to make our, our Vignier columns according to that size. So here, if, if we were going to go by 15, even though that's not correct for this example, we would divide our, our text into 15 columns and into 15 Vignier columns. And then each column we would treat like its own Caesar cipher, meaning that uh, we run a frequency analysis and correlation of frequency to figure out the shift for that column. Um, so at this point, we actually know quite a bit uh, from calculating the index of coincidence and are a lot we're a lot closer to, to decrypting it. So hopefully this, this makes the, the, the formula make a little bit more sense, even though I didn't go into the details of what is actually going on here. Um, but hopefully with, uh, with this, this explanation, uh, it makes a little bit more sense to you. It's actually in terms of what's being calculated here, it's not too dissimilar from, uh, from, the, frequency, for, from the correlation of frequency, uh, but of course it does have a different purpose, so uh, things are arranged a little bit different. Okay, so if you have questions about this, again, please post them to Piazza. Um, if, and uh, good luck, let me know, let me know what I can do uh, to help you on this.